All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today, uh, for this session, we're going to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, orchestration, uh, and specifically about the, the role orchestration plays in my use cases, which are, you know, I'm, my name is Toby Ford. I come from AT&T. I work on the NFV SDN space. And so the use cases that I care about uh, are somewhat complicated, often span many data centers, uh, many central offices, and in, nowadays is extending out to the edge, to the fog realm of UCPE and IoT and uh, base stations for the RAN. And I need to orchestrate. I need to find a way to instantiate our quote unquote virtual network functions and put them in dispersed across all of these facilities. And then uh, based on demand or uh, a lack of demand, I can scale up or scale down the resources and I can adjust. And then uh, even beyond the simple single use case, I can then uh, eventually have multiple use cases with multiple tenants and then you know, bin pack the resources I have, try to get to the goal that we have, which is essentially full asset utilization. But at, at, it, at the center part of this story is orchestration. And you may have heard the term MANO. MANO is a term that comes from the Etsy ISG's work on NFV. Uh, it's intended to represent the part of the puzzle that is, as I described, the part that helps us to manage and orchestrate the virtual network functions. So today I have a group of folks that I think will do a good job at representing this, this problem space. And then an um, example of, of the sort of what I think of as diversity and in innovation that's happened around the orchestration. There's been many attempts at solving this problem, not just within the NFV or SDN space, but also in general in IT, there's been many, many times where we've worked on this concept of orchestrating many uh, maybe automatic and manual tasks to uh, different types of resources and put them together to solve something. Uh, been a long history that way in the IT realm. So I think I've, I've tried to put together a panel that represented the, the diversity, both of the IT realm and then also of the, the telco realm, and specifically around two things. One is uh, uh, about the projects that are happening that are trying to solve for the MANO problem. So AT&T has its own way of solving for the MANO problem. Uh, other folks like China Mobile uh, has, and, uh, and a number of entities we'll talk about are working to create a new thing called OpenO, which is uh, intended to solve this problem. And then uh, we also have uh, representation from the Etsy community and a, and a new entity that's created around, uh, around that called Open Source Mano. And uh, so today, uh, let me call up to the stage uh, three of my guests. So uh, first, uh, I th think attempting to represent the traditional IT space and then also the, the solving for my problems, uh, Chris Wright from Red Hat. The, the steps are on this side. Okay. Or even better. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right, and then uh, second up, we'll have uh, Diego Lopez from Telefonica, uh, representing the Open Source Mano project. Nice. Thank you. I applaud your agility there. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, Ling Li from uh, uh, China Mobile. Uh, now. Uh, The, uh, has joined me as well as being a super user award winner. Thank you, Lingley. All right, so first, uh, my question to this group, this esteemed group is, I want to first uh, have each one of them go through and introduce themselves and what they work on. So starting with Chris. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I barely made it here, I was lost in the shuffle of trying to find this particular room. Um, so my name is Chris Wright. I am Vice President and Chief Technologist at Red Hat. I focus on our technology strategy and you know, looking at, at where the industry is moving and where open source innovation is solving new uh, interesting problems in, uh, across the industry. Okay. 
Just one second while I put this in silence, just to... You looking that up to see who you are? <laughs> no, I was trying to <laughs> spare you of the music of my end. Um, Diego Lopez, I work for Telefonica. I, uh, my position formally is called Head of uh, Technology Exploration. <clears throat> I joined Telefonica five years ago, and since then we, we started working in uh, aspects related with SDN and NFV uh, there. And I am part of the large team that is, uh, among other things, working in, in open source management. Um, hello everyone, my name is Ling Li, I work for China Mobile, I'm a current member of the NovaNet project which drives the company's SDN and NV strategy um, and I've been um, actively um, participated in the, um, some of the open source community um, around um, this idea including OPNV and OpenO and very proud to be serving um, on the board of LPNV and, and also the TSC of OpenO representing China Mobile. Thank you, everybody. So uh, well, let's start out with a simple one. Uh, let's pretend I know nothing about orchestration. Uh, could you tell me what, you, what is your definition of orchestration? I think of orchestration in terms of, um, well, first of all, in the software context. I mean, you can picture the, you know, the, the conductor at the front of an orchestra uh, getting everybody to, to work together. Uh, but, but in a software context, I think of it in terms of uh, taking multiple um, API-driven and taking multiple steps together in a concerted effort to produce a result. And typically, I look at that as, um, for example, creating a service that's a combination of a collection of independent pieces. And how do you launch that? How do you manage that? How do you, how do you update that? Um, so orchestration, collection of things done together, APIs under the hood, I think are really important. Yeah, exactly. I mean, orchestration in the musical terms is precisely make the uh, set of different individual instruments uh, to, to sound as a, as a joint instrument. This is what they call orchestration. So you take a piece of music and you make that the whole orchestra is able to play it. I, uh, the, the point here, and when it comes to the uh, particular case of uh, network service provisioning, uh, the key here is that uh, we have to live with something that in some cases is uh, it's complicated, that is install base. There is this old joke about that the creation would have been much longer than seven days if God has to deal with install base there. So, uh, and and this, is, this is precisely one of the key things here in, when talking about orchestration on network services is that we have to deal with the, 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 the deployments of network, of network functions, of virtualized network functions in an environment in which there are many uh, other network functions that are not virtualized. And they need to work together because at the end we, we, we need to orchestrate not only the virtualized part, not only the parts that is based in a cloud infrastructure, but we have to make them work with the other ones that are not part of it. And this uh, implies an additional challenges and orchestration that probably in other environments are not so, uh, so high. Makes sense. Uh, certainly the brownfield state that we have to live with and the greenfield uh, have to go uh, live in coexistence and then that's what the orchestration has to, has to cover. Mm -hmm. Ling Li? Um, yes, to my understanding, in a narrow view, I think orchestration means to, just like Chris mentioned, uh, putting some of the pieces together. Um, usually we would call it as resource or components, and then we came up and connect them and to come up with a, a deliverable, um, like a service, which can be consumed by an, another level up consumer. So I think, um, in, that, in, in, in this interpretation, I think um, actually we have orchestration in different layers. We can have orchestration in the VM layer, uh, which could compose to be an application. And we can also you know, move a level up and by com com combining different applications or VNF together, we can come up with a network service, 
as defined by the FCNV um, you know, architecture. And then still a level up, we can come up with, you know, combine our different network service, which are usually consumed by the operator, and then put them together uh, with some of the uh, project definition and also business logic. We can come up with an end-to-end -end service that can be consumed by our end user, for example, our subscribers. So at these different layers, I see different interpretation of registration. And to me, that is, that is, you know, like um, happens in the design town. And in, also in the broad view, I think at each, uh, you know, different layer of orchestration, we can also incorporate the concept of management. So um, what I have been talking about is like we came up with a blueprint which came up, uh, you know, can be composed of different components and with connections together. And with that blueprint, we can actually initiate different uh, um, services uh, instances. And we can also, you know, um, there's also key to manage that different instances all through this life cycle. And to, to us, I think, uh, you know, we believe that that is also an integral part of orchestration. Great. All right, so it sounds like we have a consistent definition of what orchestration is, and I think we touched on a few of the, the areas that I wanted to get into. Uh, and Ling Li, I think, did a good job at, at, at mentioning some of the key dimensions. So it's more than just orchestrating an, or instantiating a new thing or a new service. It's also the, the aspect of designing that service ahead of time and orchestrating that activity uh, to prepare for the time at uh, when and it's production time or real time to, to actually do that. So get, we've gotten into a few of the areas and, we, and it was good also about the, the management part of it because I think the life cycle, maintaining something, it's not just uh, placing it somewhere and making it work to, uh, to start with or implementing it, but it's also living with it over the long term, uh, scaling it up and down, making sure it runs, reinstantiating if it fails, and then uh, getting rid of it when you're done with it or when it's using or not using the resources it should be. So I think we touched on a lot of the aspects that I, I think fall into what is the definition of MANO. So I'd like Diego specifically to talk about this subject of wh why do, what, is, what is MANO and where did it come from? MANO, mano means hand in Spanish, you know? Oh, yeah. So this is, this is the first thing. And when talking about management and orchestration by chance, the two people that were uh, leading the discussion during this moment were Spanish. Well, so we decided um, to, to use it and to uh, make the community learn a little bit of, uh, of the most civilized language in the world, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, um, no, and precisely the, the name came uh, handy, if you allow me the, the poem, because it was precisely about what you do with the remote hands in the, in the environment of a data center or whatever. It's a, precisely managing and orchestrating things around when you ask someone to, to be uh, changing things and reconnecting and, and, uh, and acting on your behalf. So the idea is that uh, it was precisely this. So when, when, Mano, when we uh, coined the term Mano, what, what we wanted to, uh, to, uh, to be very clear, and this is something that is important to, uh, to understand, but that, because that influences on how some decisions that have been taken, at least in our case, afterwards, is precisely what I mentioned before about install-based. Uh, what, is, what is very important is that we try to, from the very beginning, to isolate the uh, aspects that were related to uh, the management and orchestration of the virtualized part, of the part that they were based in, in, on, a, on, a, on the cloud infrastructure, to make it isolated from the rest, from the uh, general semantics of a network function, or how you control, or how you apply SDN, or how you apply network management, or whatever. Essentially, because we were uh, aware that uh, this, uh, uh, that the, the reality in the in, in many years to come is going to be uh, hybrid networks, in which we will have a combination of I don't know optical or radio equipment that will be physical based on hardware, managed in a more or less traditional way, with something that will be much more elastic much more uh, adaptive in the sense that it will be changed and it will be uh, suitable for, for cloud operations while the other parts not. So the idea is that you have a separated uh, management and orchestration that is focused on the cloud aspects and not focused on anything else, just because to a, a general network management system, 
but look like another network component. A network component is a little bit particular that is uh, much uh, more su subject to change, but not necessarily different, so you can make a consistent management of the, uh, I mean, a consistent network management with the mano interfaces that are provided by the, uh, by the separate uh, cloud uh, um, uh, management uh, and orchestration. Awesome, so I have two questions. First for Chris, how is this, uh, how is Mano as, as Diego described it, how is that different than what, what you were doing before in the IT space or like with, specifically with your products like Managed IQ? I think there's maybe a couple key differences. Um, first of all, the notion that you have a complex task that's composed of a set of discrete uh, independent tasks like launch an aggregate application is not new, and, but it's, it's maybe defined differently. Um, and part of that definition that's different is it's the network. So we're building up the network, we're building connectivity. And uh, so many of the traditional IT tasks are focused on things like launching applications. Um, the application is more business logic and less about uh, defining the actual connectivity and, and infrastructure where in the service provider space, the connectivity and that infrastructure is the business. Um, so from, from our tooling point of view, we've really focused on things like, um, can you launch an application which is an aggregate of a set of different components uh, on differing cloud infrastructures or differing virtualization platforms? And actually, something that's very interesting to the service provider space as well, where we want to make sure that we can provide network functions uh, across a different, a disparate set of VIMs in the Etsy uh, NFV vernacular or a different set of infrastructures. So I think on the one hand, we see them as really different applications, business logic, databases, higher level languages, um, distinct from, from the network itself. But the concept, uh, an, an application being an aggregation of services like a microservices based platform or, or our, um, application translates really directly to individual network functions composed to provide a network service. So it's sort of similar concepts applied in a different space. All right. Uh, so Ling Lei, what is your thought about, uh, so uh, how does your effort around OpenO, how does that cover what is this, what we've talked about already? How, how does that cover um, the Mano space? Yes, the or, Mano. Or even begin at, before that, what is OpenO? Um, Good question. I think just as I stated, I think orchestration has the integral part of management. So management and orchestration, I think that is, you know, it has to be, you know, a part of a meaningful solution for us. And um, as for Etsy's definition for Mano, I think um, it fits well with the network, a service layer, orchestration and the management. And it is specifically targeted at the NV orchestration and within, you know, like um, da uh, data center and cloud. And for us as OpenO, I think there's a unique feature that we see actually we, we have to deliver the solution from the end-to-end -end orchestration layer, uh, which means that we have to, in addition to NV orchestration, we have also to do SDN uh, orchestration, which means that we have to also provide connectivity service in addition to NFV services, with network service composed of VNFs residing in the cloud also connect different data centers and also you know provide the last mile um, last mile connectivity to the end users device to our data center and cloud so that is actually two parts of orchestration esteem orchestration which manage the connect connectivity service orchestration and in addition to NV orchestration all right so that makes sense but uh, back to so why did, where did OpenO come from? Is it intended just to solve that problem or is it gonna extend to more things or what is the, wh how does OpenO play in this space? Um, OpenO has, um, I think it has a two layer orchestration model. 
At the top layer, uh, this is a uh, global service orchestrator uh, which deals with the end-to-end -end service orchestration that is consumer oriented and um, which is actually the service, end-to-end -end, um, service is composed of two types of service, network service um, is one of them and connectivity services is, is another type and they're orchestrated uh, respectively by LVO and SDNO. So I think our LVO uh, part is quite aligned with uh, the Etsy LV architecture, you know, the, the Minor, minor part, excuse me. And for the SDN um, part, I think it's quite aligned with MAP's uh, you know, definition for LSO. And we try to combine that to provide the end-to-end -end orchestration capability. And we also work with multiple WIMPs and multiple uh, WIMF managers to, you know, to um, increase our capability in outsourcing um, other open source components and make it a whole solution. All right, thank you. Uh, Diego, and then uh, can you help explain how, uh, where did open source Mano come from and how does it cover the space other well, than the name? Open source Mano comes from uh, some uh, orchestration uh, components that we have some time ago in, in well, we started as something that we called our NFE reference lab two years, three years ago, in which our idea was precisely to, uh, well, to, to, to get some insight on what the uh, rest of the industry was doing uh, around NFE and with the different virtual machines, the different virtualization platforms, the different uh, choices for, for orchestrating the resources, the cloud resources, et cetera, on the one hand, and on the second hand, to, well, to, to bring some awareness inside the company, Telefonica is, um, has a size, you know, and, and is uh, from time to time difficult to, um, to reach all the, uh, all the parts, and the idea was to, to have a clear showcase for what we were doing. And uh, when the, one of the things that were, uh, was, cl uh, was clear from the beginning was what they needed a, an orchestration platform. We started to play with it. And from a certain moment and in conversations uh, with some people that were working with us as well, we, we thought that it was mature enough to try to attend uh, to, to make them open source and to make it an open, a full-fledged open source project, not only delivering as open source, but looking for additional collaboration and, and cooperation and people coming from different uh, um, other companies, other institutions, bringing their, uh, their inputs and making the, and making the whole thing evolve. And, and we, started, we started like that. We started very, uh, let's say, modest and small, and we have uh, grown in that direction. And I think that uh, right now we have released uh, what is actually the third release, but it's called release one. Because <laughs> first we started with a, re a seed release that was just uh, putting all pieces together. Second was release zero. That was the first one that has, uh, had code built in pur on purpose for, for, the, uh, for, for this, uh, for, for this um, project. And now release one is, one, is the, the one we are <clears throat> is able to demonstrate where we want to head. And is, uh, now it has something that is very, very close. It would say the closest you can get in an open source project to production level uh, software. We are very, uh, very glad with, of it. Mostly OSM is focusing right now on what I said before, on the orchestration of the MANO problem, on the orchestration of network functions inside an network environment. It's not trying to, uh, it's not addressing the, the rest of the space. Sure. In, uh, and it's, uh, it's pure MANO, though it's not, uh, I mean, it follows or try to, uh, tries to solve the problems around MANO, but it's not following 100% the current architecture. I mean, I, I don't know if many of you have seen this, uh, diagram coming from Etsy about the MANO stack with the three pieces, the NFO, the, VM, the VNF, M, and the, and the VIM. doesn't follow 100% that. It doesn't provide exactly those interfaces. But the behavior is precisely of a, of a full MANO stack. And it's concentrated on that. And that implies that in principle, I don't see why not it could be uh, able to work, for example, with uh, OpenO in the future, able to integrate with Ecomp, able to work with the... Um, um, Manage IQ. Manage IQ. But, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I wrote, uh, so, because at the end, it's a, it's, a, it's a piece that is very much focused on solving that problem, not trying to, uh, uh, to go beyond that. And we, 
we are aware that there will be other solutions that will be able to be uh, part of the, uh, of, the, of the whole puzzle. That makes sense. So uh, one part of the, that Diego brought up is that uh, AT&T has made a, a thing called eComp, which is enhanced control, orchestration, management, and policy. So the ohm part of it is uh, similar to Mano. Uh, but we've tried to do more than that, and you know we're we're addressing a larger problem of of the OSS space from telcos, uh, specifically around policy uh, enforcement across the whole system. Um, some of the uh, dynamics of service definition, which, uh, especially about VNF onboarding, and then trying to work with VNFs to, to sort of create a template for how they they show up. So there's a few parts that I think are uh, meta to the, to the mano part of it. But at its core, it also has a piece that does this management and orchestration function. So today, what we're faced with is, uh, at least between a subset of us, is a lot of, re of redundant effort. And so we're, we're currently having discussions about how to bring it all together. But given that we're at the OpenStack Summit, I, I did want to ask Chris a, a question specifically about, well, given that we're here, how can OpenStack help? Uh, some of it, it obviously has a few projects that, that could help this way, uh, whether it's uh, Murano or Heat or Mistral or Tacker or uh, Congress. Uh, how, how can OpenStack help uh, to maybe yeah. deal with this problem? So I think that the, the first question is, uh, is that the right place to do it? And the second question is, what are the specific projects in OpenStack that are, that are helpful? Um, and if you look across a lot of these different efforts, we're actually using some of these components that you mentioned. Um, so things like heat are pretty consistently used uh, to do basic uh, definition of, of an application and, some, and potentially some scaling parameters around the application. Um, we also have looked at using a project called Tacker uh, to help essentially expose that, that onboarding portion and give definition to, uh, you're, you're bringing something into a platform. You need to, to tell the platform what is what its uh, SLA, the end result of the SLA is going to um, require a certain set of resources from, from the underlying infrastructure. And so, you know, we've got something that says, hey, how do you, how do you provide a, a VNF with a descriptor and then deploy that onto uh, an OpenStack platform. And you know, Tacker's trying to help there, especially when you are doing multi, you know, as, as um, the OpenO project has, has described, there's potentially a difference between the NFB orchestration and the SDN orchestration. And so how do you reach out to an SDN controller and define a service function chain that's going to be associated with the independent serv uh, network functions that are build up this composite service? Um, so, You've, you know, you've got workflow orchestration in, in OpenStack. Um, and I think one of the questions for the service provider community is um, how much do you expect to run your network functions across multiple different platforms? And if you're running across a lot of different platforms, then building the entire stack completely in OpenStack is only going to solve one problem. Um, and so I think what, what we're seeing is interest in having cross-cloud compatibility and um, so we want to leverage the, the primitives of OpenStack without building the entire stack as an, as an OpenStack project. Um, that's how it looks to me. Makes sense. Uh, Diego or, or Lingley, do you have other commentary about the OpenStack part? No, pre precisely. First of all, when you mentioned this of having the, uh, the primitives of OpenStack without the whole OpenStack uh, deployment, is something that we started some time ago that we call OpenVim, which is a uh, sort of a streamlined OpenStack. Something that you can, is a, is a much uh, thinner than the, uh, than the normal OpenStack uh, deployment, thinking precisely of the kind of, uh, of deployment you would do in a, in a small central office, or the kind of deployment you would do for a, for a, um, for a head of uh, managing different radio, radio base stations. This is something that, uh, well, and, and this is something that it could be interesting to, uh, to explore how we can combine it, because formally it's not an OpenStack project, because, well, for us, we, we are not that many. We are, we are a small group of people working on, in development, so we have to, to be, well, we, we are playing a little bit. To some extent, we are playing a startup inside Telefonica. 
and we are very much focused on trying to, to make things happen, um, but uh, precisely uh, we're pushing things in a community of this size, just for you to know, I'm not sure if you're aware, but pushing things, certain things in this community is complicated simply because of the size of the community and there's so many forces that are around pushing and pulling in different directions. And, uh, but uh, this is precisely something that we, we have learned that it would be very interesting, at least for our environment, and I guess in other environments that could benefit from uh, OpenStack interfaces without the need of the whole complexity of a full-fledged uh, OpenStack stack. Uh, first, uh, and this is one of the main goals. For us, OpenStack is essential as a, as a, precisely as a reference, at the reference that we are using for the, for the platforms that we are mandating in, the, uh, in, our, in our initial uh, uh, pilots and, 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 and deployments. And, is a, and precisely it's a way of, a, of, a <clears throat> of a making this reference and um, making clear for us that we can move from uh, one provider to another provider by moving our code or the code of the third parties that are collaborating with us. And, and, and well, something that is very important as well is that the knowledge that we collect is, is reusable. That is extremely important when you have people trained, uh, working with that. Because, you know, this obsession with vendor locking very often is not only about the compatibility, because if you, then it's a, it's a matter of price. If yeah. you pay enough, pay enough money, you will have something different. At the end, it's a matter of knowledge. You simply don't know what you can do with the new stuff. Now it's something that brings you a certain stability in your, in your knowledge. You, have, you, you know in which direction you have to look, and this is very important as well. Sure. So, Ling Li, how does OpenO work with OpenStack today, and is, are you reusing components that way? Um, actually, we, we see OpenStack as the de facto you know, um, solution for a component for WIM. Um, virtual infrastructure manager, and we are also, you know, well aware that there are some some of the projects in OpenStack community that might have overlap uh, with some of the components uh, within the OpenL community. And actually, I think we are open. Uh, we actually, um, I'm going to put it. Um, we're open to any of the open source, um, you know, efforts that could complement and also make a part of OpenL community. But we. And actually, you know, do our choice or um, um, to try to keep aligned with other, you know, community like OpenStack. I think there are some of the principles. The first one is that um, we we try to keep to push the alignment, you know, between the different interfaces and especially data modeling. So um, if we can keep aligned, you know, within different community regarding these two aspects. Even though we are not, you know, outsourcing uh, to each other, we can be com in in cooperate, incorporatable and be in replaceable uh, with different components. And that's to me, you know, the uh, the most um, appealing feature for open source communities. And the second principle would be, um, uh, especially, uh, how can I put it, um, the ease of use. Some of the components, uh, for example, as you mentioned, Mister, and uh, actually we, we have our own like version of Mister in Open O. Why we need, why we are not using that um, is because of the ease of usability. We see that you know there is a user friendly GUI would be a very appealing feature, especially at the very top layer of orchestration, which the 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 operator staff would be using to define uh, the service template. So without that feature, um, it's, it's, um, you know, there'd be, you know, um, so, so we, we did some comparison and made our choice in SQL, but that, that is not to say that we are closed the doors for, for other, you know, like components and other um, efforts in, um, in other communities. And as long as we are, you know, in, interoperable, um, we can, you know, join together. And I think I, it slipped in my mind. I, I think I have a third principle. Which one's that? Fun, having fun. <laughs> having fun it's, it's much more fun if you have open source, believe me. Oh yes, tacker. 
uh, and service function chaining. I would like to mention that and um, actually uh, we see Tacker as a generic VNF manager because you know they, they all operate at different layers of orchestration and heat. Uh, as uh, we see heat is operating at the VM layer building up the application and attacker or juju operating at application layer um, building uh, yes application layer and using it can use heat or whatever interface that open stack provides or other wind provides and especially on um, at and actually we we have been you know um, you know, talking with Tacker guys, and we, we welcome their contribution to our community so that we can also have Tacker as our generic VNF manager as well. And there is another form of, um, you know, collaboration, and specifically to SFC, is I, um, we were actually using the um, net networking SFC, you know, project, which is residing OpenStack, uh, their defined APIs as as our you know interface between um, orchestrator and SFC and, um, controller. So in that case, we are actually interoperable with OpenStax some of these solutions, and and that's it. All right, thank you. Yeah, so I think the the idea uh, I think across uh, the group we've seen a number of of ideas about how to perhaps consolidate efforts and then also to interwork and then uh, find a way to, to innovate while continuing to innovate, uh, to integrate while continuing to innovate. Uh, so yeah, I think this was a, was a good discussion. So right now I'd like to actually uh, uh, offer up uh, the microphones on the sides here. If anyone would like to ask any kind of questions, feel free to stand up to that uh, Microphone, and we'll talk about uh, whatever. Uh, looking forward to that gentleman's question. Uh, Ian? Hey, um, yes. You know me, I'm here to cause trouble, so I, I will ask uh, one question. Um, to start with your analogy that you came up with originally, that you're talking about a conductor standing in front of an orchestrator and ensuring that everybody works as a whole to accomplish a given task, then a conductor's main role in leading an orchestra, uh, orchestra is not the one in front of an audience, but the one far before then, when he's trying to get everybody to work to one end and to fix the problems that he's seeing. So uh, in the NFE world, when you're doing orchestration, then I would say one topic that doesn't seem to get covered well is the idea of repairing problems. You're running on a cloud, you will have in inevitably in a large cloud with lots of servers, you will have these problems, you will lose virtual machines. Um, how do you see your orchestration solutions solving the repair problem as opposed to simply the deployment problem? Yeah, so let me talk about one part of it uh, with regard to eComp. I mean, this is one central difference uh, or central thing that we're focused on within eComp. may not be a difference, but it's about the closed loop control and then setting up these not only around service management and problem management, incident management, but also around the whole service definition. But creating this closed loop where I'm taking in analytics, I'm taking in feedback from the system or from customers, and then I'm using that information, processing it maybe through an ML system of some kind, and then acting on it and using the orchestration as a way of, of getting back to the right state. Uh, so that closed loop concept is, is an integral part of our e-comp work. I, I, I mean, I, would, I think at a, a cross industry level, we are, it's still early, so we're focused on the, the building blocks, but if you look at everybody's work, there, is ten, there tends to be some notion of event-based processing coming out of the infrastructure or the actual network functions themselves and then actions that you take. And that could be as simple as scale up because you've got some peak. Um, it could be more complex, like there's been some fault that is in hardware that's percolating through the system you need to redeploy. Uh, but in, you know, I think in all of the cases, an event stream, some level of analytics against the event stream and some remediation is, is core to the, 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 the end result that we're striving for. But if you can't describe the function and you can't launch it onto the infrastructure, then you don't have that problem yet. And I think we're still mostly talking about just getting things, getting things launched. Um, no, but fr frankly, we, we have, uh, well, one project running and a couple of, a couple of proposals 
launched recently precisely on, on this idea of um, repairing in general about resiliency, including, including security and including the, the ability of uh, identifying and, and trying to uh, alleviate security problems, not only, not only failures, but uh, you know, ill-intentioned attacks to the, uh, to the infrastructure. As Chris said, it's still early. I mean, it's not that, that we can claim that it, it, it is integral part of the orchestration suite, uh, but this is something that we are aware of. Last uh, OPNFV meeting, it was precisely uh, showing some results. Um, we, are th um, we are talking with the Open Daylight uh, people as well in trying to bring the results we have, trying to make them uh, an integral part of their, of their, of their projects and, and so have it as, um, uh, well, part of the, of the normal toolbox that we'll be using in hopefully a couple of years to build networks. So if I may add, I think a high availability or fair offer is one of the key features of telecom services. And we traditionally deal with the problem with the, uh, you know, um, a combination uh, solution from a single vendor, which provides hardware and, and software all together. And, um, so in NFV environment, um, you know, that blocks is actually uh, break down into different layers. And to uh, deliver, you know, comparable high availability to traditional, like a black box, I think it needs collaboration between different layers. And especially, I think, um, how we deal with each of the high, av high availability issues um, of a specific VNF, it actually depends on what it requires at different layers. For example, some of the VNFs, they are um, typically IT application and they, re they are very comfortable of relying on the infrastructure to do uh, the fare over and they are not so sensitive to, you know, to service continu continuity requirements. In that case, I think it would you know, depends on the infrastructure and the cloud infrastructure to provide them with some of the fair over mechanisms, for, for example, uh, migration or, uh, you know, VM reboot. And for some of the technical features of VNFs, for example, our current network VNFs, actually uh, there are very uh, strict requirements regarding their service con continuity, and we could get sued by, uh, you know, by our government or subscriber for blocking that service for a probably short time frame. So in that case, we definitely need, you know, collaboration between different layers. And um, what, what our orchestration part do will be, would be to make sure that for each of the specific VNF, their requirements their policy uh, regarding fair over to be clearly specified in the data, uh, in the metadata, and uh, conveyed to um, you know the specific and um, policy enforcement uh, entities. For example, for, for the IT application, that would be the infrastructure, and for some of the technical VNFs, that would be a collaboration between different layers. And I, I think there's also another part to the story on is the monetary part. So um, in terms of you know, policies or something that you might take um, proactive action to actually avoid failover, over, um, we have to monitor other status and resource consumptions, something like that, and all the alarms from different um, components and VNFs. So orchestration also ha has to play this key role at uh, state alarm monitoring to you know, to complement to a, a total solution. And that is my take on this problem. All right, thank you. Uh, next question. Hi there. Um, how would you compare the state of play in the um, NFV and open stack orchestration space with what's um, becoming available in the container space with Kubernetes and Swarm and Mesosphere? I think that's a very good question. Do you want to take that one? Um, so the, the one level of orchestration is just where you place the workload, uh, how you launch a workload. And, we, and so some of that's just almost more about scheduling. And so from one perspective, you've got Nova doing scheduling of VMs. You've got something like Kubernetes doing scheduling of, of containers. And so the question is more about where is your application running? Is it containerized or is it, is it, is it in a VM? Um, you also have some interesting 
uh, definitions in the application orchestration layers, so like Kubernetes or Swarm, um, where it's a fo the focus is actually building that aggregate application out of a set of services, which in the networking world would translate to an aggregate set of functions composing to a service. Um, and, and there, there's, there's been work that we need to be interoperable with from an industry point of view so that when you define a service, um, a network service, it, we need to be able to deploy that onto, in my opinion, onto a um, application orchestration fabric like, like Kubernetes in a way that makes sense. So we don't want to completely redefine the world over here in the service provider space, only to find that when you go to um, an application orchestration uh, tool like Kubernetes, it doesn't, doesn't fit, or it's, we're re, you know, redefining, we've re completely rebuilt a bunch of infrastructure. Um, and I think the, the real question is how much of the network is going to reside in bare metal, in VMs, and in containers. And you know, my personal opinion is that a containerized uh, future in the network is inevitable, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it will all be there. And, and so we are thinking a lot. I think I know at Red Hat and, and across the industry, we're thinking a lot about how we can uh, bring these things together. And one of the things that, that we were trying to demonstrate specifically with Manage IQ is all of these problems are similar across the different industries. And so you do service definition, you create a service catalog, you launch a service, you monitor the service, you scale the service, you may want to launch it across different infrastructures. And part of what we were trying to demonstrate is you could build a comprehensive network service out of some functionality sitting in VMs in OpenStack and some functionality actually sitting in containers on, on AWS, um, which is probably uh, the most extreme version of all the differences you might find in a service provider's infrastructure providing a single network service. So containers, very important part of the future, making sure what we're doing now is compatible with the, the orchestration done and application uh, orchestration tools, very important. Yeah, I think one point to add to that, because we have to move on, but uh, you know, I think containers actually provides an opportunity to simplify, uh, to make the orchestration easier on us. Uh, because the things that we were doing before can be done already in the template or in the Docker format that, that's there. So there's, I think, an enormous opportunity to help us to simplify. Uh, one last question from Beth, because uh, I always over. Bella Telecom. Uh, so my question is, um, the proliferation of orchestrators has started. Uh, so I'd like your, uh, the panel's comments on how to deal with that, um, that issue. I, I know we are personally, I, I personally am already dealing with it. So, uh, you know, orchestrators are in the cloud, they're out at the edge, they're all over the place, and they need to interact with each other. So. Yeah, Diego, we want to do that. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure if you're refer, referring to the fact that we're using the term or orchestrator all over the place, or oh, just that we have so many everywhere. Yeah, it's like standards. Um, great, yeah, no, we I have mean, so many of I them. mean, probably, probably it's because everyone at each level uh, wants to feel that is in charge of the orchestra, that they are the, the conductor and not one of the players. And this is something that is, I would say, it's human in that sense. Um, as long as what you're talking about is about allocating resources according to a certain a, a, a definition of a model of what you want, to, what you want to achieve, you have an orchestrator. And we have, uh, inside the HCNFV group, we have been discussing precisely about different orchestration layers. You can call it orchestrator, or you can call it manager, or you can call it a policy enforcer, whatever. But at the end, is that you have different layers of concern uh, that normally are associated very much uh, with business models. I mean, if I am a, if I'm, a, I'm providing infrastructure, I mean, providing infrastructure up to the uh, to the operating system, I will have an, an an infrastructure orchestrator because it's my concern. If I am consuming that, I'm, I'm in the deploying BNFs. Uh, functions, I will have an or a function orchestrator because, because it's my concern. And if I, I am providing services, I will have my service orchestrator. And even if I am a customer, I will be thinking about my business orchestrator or whatever. I don't see anything wrong with that as long as it is clear that there is no, uh, I mean, there is not uh, a, a hierarchy, but is a, a set of uh, relationships among different objects. This is one thing. Second thing that probably is about that there are many 
uh, uh, offerings uh, right now in open source and in uh, 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 proprietary uh, uh, fields, it's natural as well because we are starting from different, uh, I would say different <coughs> goals and different analysis of the, of the current reality. And as I said before, most of the efforts I'm aware of should be able to work and to interpret as long as, uh, as Lingley said before, they are, they are using compatible models and they're using, compa not even not necessarily compatible interfaces, but they are based on compatible data models. Because an interface is something that is easy to, to build at the end. And uh, they will be cover, covering the whole space, probably with some overlapping, but this is the same thing that we have in any, uh, uh, in, the, in the general computer industry, that you can do things always with a couple of different things covering a little bit more of space in each one. So I think <clears throat> it's part of the natural evolution. I personally, I'm not concerned about that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much uh, to the panel. I appreciate everybody's help. Uh, uh, I, I'll do respect to the next group who I'm big fans of. Uh, I'd like to see their panels too. So thank you everybody for coming.